Well, good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to those of you on the Western States. Thank you for joining us, Stadia, today for five key steps to building your DMP business case. My name is Greg Root. I'm the Director of Sales Enablement at Stadia, and I'll be your host for the next hour. All of you are currently on mute, but if you have a question, please use the chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen and send it to me, and uh, we will get to all of them. Um, our speaker today is uh, Daryl Cypress. He's our Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at Estadia. Daryl has been helping marketing departments through their digital transformations for almost 15 years now. And for the past five years, much of his effort has been focused on DMP. Uh, his work uh, includes a diverse set of industries, including wine and spirits, pharmaceutical, financial services, and global CPG companies. Uh, with that, Daryl, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Greg. Okay, uh, thanks everyone for joining the call today. Uh, I hope you find it uh, informative and um, uh, really uh, enlightening as you uh, embark on your DMP journey. So. Uh, our quick agenda we have for you today, uh, we're going to walk through um, three basic areas of the presentation. Um, quickly, we'll do a, an overview of just DMP in general, just to level set the call and make sure uh, that everyone on the call uh, understands what a DMP is uh, and, uh, and why you need it. Uh, uh, secondly, we'll talk about pre-work um, that um, companies typically uh, need to do but uh, do not always complete uh, before you start the business case uh, and then we'll go into um, the business case for a DMP and the five key areas um, uh, that you would do to build your business case. So those are the areas we'll, we'll, we'll touch today. Um, so the question is um, why does your company need a data management platform? And I assume that's why most of us are on the call today uh, because there's interest in a DMP um, uh, either from the IT department, uh, the marketing department, or some other part of your organization that has heard about this term, um, and you're looking for more information for how you would sell this within your, your, within your ecosystem. Today, there's a fragmented experience across the, um, across the life cycle. Uh, marketers today are struggling with these basic five areas um, within their marketing departments. Uh, one, how do you attract more customers into your funnel? How do you build uh, more of a customer base um, as you're either launching new products or competing against other companies? So attraction of new leads is, is critical and it's really the core of why we're having a DMP discussion today. Um, so after you attract them, how do you engage them? Um, you know, what are, the, what are the next things you need to do to make sure that once you've attracted them, um, they stay engaged? Um, sometimes companies uh, are struggling with blind spots between channels. And uh, this leads to just a, a bunch of problems around engagements and how to keep um, clients satisfied. Or the next piece is nurturing. So um, I have attracted them, I've engaged them, now I need to nurture them. Um, how do I make sure that I'm sending the right messages to these, uh, to these potential clients and keeping them engaged in the, in the entire funnel? Uh, obviously, conversion is key because conversion allows you to um, build revenue from uh, the pieces that you convert. And then after that, how do you retain those people? So this is a pretty key area for all of us, attracting, engaging, nurturing, converting, and retaining. Um, and this is a core foundation pieces for uh, the DMP model. Uh, when we think about a DMP and we think about segmentation and we think about who are we really targeting, there are basically three um, key areas. We want to be able to recognize people. So who are, the, who are we segmenting against? Who are we building these audiences for? You know, is it millennials? Uh, could it be a Gen X group? Um, could it be baby boomers? It could be geographies, uh, it could be uh, certain things that people are doing. So being able to right, target the right people and building those demographics is key to success. Uh, then secondly, how do we reach them? Well, there's multiple channels. Is it a social reach? Is it a media? Is it mobile? So how do we reach them? And that's really key also. And then how do we make them relevant? So is it more around being able to understand how do we uh, drive a loyalty program? 
you know, how do we convert this into revenue? So all these key areas are really key as we think about how, uh, this uh, DMP platform and how do we make this successful. After that, well, how do you reach your customers? Well, if you think of this circle here, and, and a customer can be replaced with consumer also, so it's not just customer. There's various pieces here that will really allow you to see how complex marketing and IT departments are today. Um, everyone on this phone is probably engaged in an e-commerce solution. There may be a CRM solution somewhere within the ecosystem. Analytics, there's marketing automation, there's social. So there's a lot of different pieces here um, that you can collect data from within your enterprise. Uh, all companies typically will have a website. Um, you know, there's testing that goes on. So all of these pieces, whether or not they're channels or applications, feed into the data that you would need within a DMP platform. When you think of CMO and CIO challenges today, you know, over the next five years, uh, marketing is, and uh, it's becoming more complex. And it's not just um, the packages, but it's the data required to make the packages successful. So when you really think about implementing a DMP platform, um, you know, marketing cannot do it alone. There is definitely a, a, a challenge with implementing this platform um, only from this uh, perspective that you need uh, friends in the IT department to do it. And why is that? Well, it's data heavy. So, you know, if you're a company that has disparate data and data that's in a lot of different places, it's silo, it's fragmented, um, there's a lot of discussions that will have to happen of, what data do you pull into a DMP? And we'll have a discussion quickly about the first party data within your ecosystem. Uh, so fragmented, disparate data, fragmented data, you know, a fragmented customer experience um, are all challenges to a DMP. Um, device identity challenge, so understanding, you know, are you representing one person or three people as you start to really understand who your audience is as you sort of push marketing messages out. Uh, a misalignment of sales and uh, sales and marketing. Well, you know, we hope those groups would operate in harmony, but they typically don't. Um, so, you know, marketing wants to um, generate good leads, good qualified leads, pass those over to the sales team. Uh, sales wants to feel like the leads that are coming over have been vetted, and at the end of the day, there should be you know, harmony between the two groups. But, but oftentimes, we see a misalignment. Uh, just because of the quality uh, going back and forth. Uh, lost revenue uh, for leads that should have been higher than we thought uh, or overspending on products and buying media uh, that really add no value are also problems and challenges. And then just unable to track spend, all, spend across the ecosystem. So when you look at what a DMP can help you with, there's just a, 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 just a, a wide range of topics, um, not only the data, uh, but, you know, connecting your ad tech, um, which is a DMP, and your MarTech, which could be your email um, service, um, together, your customer experience, and your analytics. And that's really uh, the, uh, the main value of a DMP. When you think of, again, the channels, we look at um, the data that's coming in from different parts of your ecosystem. Uh, the first party data is, is your data. It's data that you own. It's coming out of your CRM system. It's data that's collected in your e-commerce site. So if you're selling a product, um, you collect data on who's buying the product. You can feed that into your DMP. Um, if you're collecting data from your Facebook uh, account or Twitter, um, you can change that and move that into a DMP fairly quickly also. Uh, emails that are coming in from a marketing campaign and results of that can be fed into a DMP. So all of that data within the ecosystem um, can move into a DMP. And hopefully, um, you know, as you're doing this, um, you're not running into roadblocks of things like, um, I've got too much data, uh, you know, it, it's gonna take years to figure this out. Uh, we advise clients um, that even if your data is, um, is disparate or bad, um, you can still implement a DMP and clean up your data along the way. So there's multiple places you can do this in. Um, Third-party data is the data out on the Internet. It's 
sort of anonymized cookie data, and that's the data that's really the value of the DMP and matching that data to your first party data, and that's where you'll find a lot of the value across the DMP landscape. And obviously, if you look at the row um, in the middle, you know, optimizing your data and your audiences, um, analyzing that, um, being able to personalize it, target, retarget, build lookalike models and prospect are all built to drive revenue for your company. So it doesn't really, it really, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, it's all built to drive revenue within your particular company. And then obviously, if you look at the row at the bottom, that helps you push um, the results of that data back out to the right channels to help you target the right, um, the target the right audiences. All right, so that level sets the room. Um, so we can sort of go into the pre-work and kind of the things that are important as you sort of think about your DMP. So I think of it as sort of a five-level model where um, we think of things um, that will help us get to the business case and there won't be you know, many challenges along the way. So I think of things like governance. And governance is the ability to uh, build governing principle and metrics and have clear ownership across the whole DMP uh, platform. So when you think about it, it's a big, it's a big uh, sort of undertaking to go into a DMP platform. So in order to do this, you want to have a good governance model set up where you've got people who are good stakeholders, who understand the IT side, who understand the marketing side, and who can really sort of um, be your champions within the enterprise. Um, and, that, and I think that really is the, kind of the key um, to uh, being successful in that model. Second is the services and sort of capabilities. And when you think of that, um, you want to be able to have this really understood where from a services and capabilities landscape, um, you can understand what you need to do, um, sort of lay out um, you know, how you'd build it, uh, what a run model would look like, and how would you sort of enhance this as you move it out through either a US-based rollout or a global rollout. And I think that would be um, pretty key to understand going forward um, in your pre-work. Uh, the next thing which is pretty critical is your technology uh, and information. Uh, DMPs touch uh, a lot of different parts within the ecosystem of your company. So really being able to understand um, how a DMP uh, you know, can scale and grow, um, how much IT support would be needed, uh, the integrations and uh, pieces of the uh, organization would have to be inter uh, interfaced or integrated into a DMP is pretty critical. Uh, understanding core functionality and, and things sort of like data that would be fit, fit into the DMP is pretty critical. So those are things that would play um, pretty prominently into um, a DMP solution. Uh, the fourth is a timeline. So it's pretty critical to understand the timeline of uh, tasks and things that are going to happen. And that's pretty, pretty important because uh, when people think about a DMP platform, they think that it's going to take uh, two years or uh, you know, a significant amount of time, and is this really worth my undertaking? Uh, you know, a lot of this can be done in very um, uh, quick steps, but it's best to lay those things out ahead of time uh, so you know that you try not to take on sort of a big bang approach and take on too much work too fast. And I think that would be... Um, uh, you know, a key piece of the pre-work. And then one thing that's always key is sort of the sort of vendor um, roadmap. And uh, what we hear a lot is that when you get into this DMP discussion within your company, a lot of people have um, a discussion around, well, who are the top vendors? Uh, you know, who are the top companies that, 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 um, that are leading the, product, uh, leading the ecosystem? So you may go to Gartner or Forrester and look at uh, industry reports, and there's always you know the top you know five or six vendors that are out there. But how do you know those are the ones for you? So it's always good to do a little bit of research because even as you build out your business case, still there will be people within your organization who will ask those questions, and it should be um, it would be pretty important to um, 
be able to name the top two or three uh, vendors um, as you build out your business case. Um, and that way it sort of um, helps show credibility as you push this along the path. Um, so that, this would be the, sort of the five steps of the, of the pre-work at this point. Okay. All right, so now that all the stakeholders um, have a foundation and your pre-work is complete, um, it's time for the budget discussion. Uh, and budget discussions are always tough discussions, especially with IT applications. And one thing that, um, for those who are on the phone with a marketing background, uh, a lot of the products that have been created today, whether they're marketing automation, DMP, uh, cloud-based uh, uh, CRM products, uh, analytic products, they've been primarily built um, uh, to remove the need for a lot of IT support. Um, that's why you see decision process and a lot of the budget owners for sort of marketing automation, uh, DMP, and those type of decisions starting with the marketing departments. Um, but in the last few years, the complexity of these products have driven um, the need to continue to engage IT uh, as you implement these products. So um, one thing that I'm going to stress in the balance of the presentation as we talk about the business case is really understanding um, how you must engage IT um, as you continue on um, with your DMP assessment. Okay. All right. Let's go into the detail of the five steps uh, uh, building out your business case for the uh, for your DMP platform. Okay, and I guess Greg, before I start, are, are there any questions um, at this point, Greg? Before I go into this, uh, we no. At this point, we don't have any questions, Daryl. So keep going. Okay, great, great. All right, uh, time to build your business case and ask for budget. And hopefully, everyone is aligned, and hopefully, everyone's been listening. And there's not this sort of head scratching and people saying, "Well, okay, well, what is a DMP?" Because you still get. You'll still get that uh, even after they have a DMP discussion. It's a fairly complex discussion, so it's always good to continue to level set and get people engaged um, in the right uh, in the right uh, context as you, as you discuss a DMP. Okay, um, step one of the business case. So it's important to list the benefits as you think about why you want a DMP or what do you think. Uh, you're going to use it for or why you need it. Uh, a lot of times we hear from clients that there's two basic reasons for a DMP. One is um, my I want to drive more sales. Um, emails are not do doing it uh, and email is still king as, as everyone probably knows. Uh, but we're not meeting our targets and we're not targeting the right audiences. Uh, with our message. So we believe a DMP uh, is the right way to go. Uh, the second um, re most um, prevalent reason we hear from about a DMP is the fact that um, my, my competitors have a DMP so I should have one. So those are the top two reasons uh, that we hear uh, why a company is looking at a DMP. Uh, ultimately you need to collect your um, your benefits across both marketing and and technical uh, folks within the organization. Uh, we've heard clients say, well, I, I want to identify and acquire new customers, um, you know, linking research, uh, uh, browsing on e-commerce, and being a sort of to link e-commerce into my ecosystem and using that data to push um, the message from a DMP perspective. Uh, I want to retain existing customers and I want to upsell and cross-sell. Uh, there's a lot of companies that have their own SaaS solutions. Uh, we do a lot of work with high-tech companies in, the, in Silicon Valley and so they may have a product that they might want to serve and add to within the product. Um, it's not just serving ads you know, outside of the product so that's been a, uh, uh, something we've seen a lot of. 
uh, I want to truly understand the ideal consumer, and I just want a holistic view of all of everything around the analytics of what I'm doing. Uh, every product out there produces, um, when you think of the products in your ecosystem, whether it's analytics or marketing automation, um, CRM, they all produce their own analytics. Um, and DMP is, a, is kind of a way um, that would be, that's fairly nice to start looking at all that data um, also um, in one unified area. Uh, from a technical pain point perspective, um, a lot of it is around data and data redundancy and integrations. You know, how much work will it take for me to do this from an integration standpoint? Uh, if I have a middleware service layer, can I use a DMP? Uh, answer is yes. Uh, if I, you know, if I just want to go point to point, can I use a DMP? The answer is yes. If I have bad data and I, it's a, we, we're spending three to four years to clean it up, do I need to wait? Uh, no, you don't, because you can continue to push forward with a DMP. So there's a lot of questions that we get from from clients around this, um, and they're fairly um, straightforward because we've done so, um, we have experience in this area. So I think it's uh, uh, this slide probably really encapsulates what we've been hearing in the industry. When you think of um, still step one, it's also good to really understand how you can sort of drive costs down and increase the top line. So uh, again, a lot of these products were built to really, they're, they're cloud-based products, they're SaaS products, and most of them were built to really eliminate a lot of the IT involvement. But again, from an, a DMP perspective, IT will definitely need to be involved in, in your discussions. But when you really think about where you can save money and save costs, you know, you don't have to stand up. Um, I work with one client that had uh, 37 different data warehouses. So if you, if you don't need to stand up additional data warehouses or, or buy additional servers or additional equipment, then you, all, you already got sort of a cost savings and a cost reduction uh, on the IT side. Uh, and that's huge because that allows you to sort of build your business case without having to add uh, capitalized costs related to servers and technologies around that area. When you think about um, increasing the top line, a lot, a lot of it deals with driving better campaigns, whether it's across um, digital campaigns, email campaigns, uh, banner ads, um, display ads, um, you know, just a whole programmatic buying, you know, being able to um, use a DMP to target better so you're not um, spending money where you shouldn't. And the more you target the right audience, the right segments to build the right audiences, um, the more likely you're going to be able to drive um, uh, more people to your business. And that's really the key point of a DMP is to be able to drive more business into the top of the funnel. Um, and so that will help increase top line revenue. So. So ultimately, if you can make the argument of how you're going to drive costs down and how you're going to drive top line revenue, that's a key part of the uh, of step one of the business case. Okay, um, and step two, if you think about just a marketing uh, budget, and this is a fictitious, uh, um, uh, fictitious company, uh, five million dollars in um, an annual spend. Uh, if you look at a lot of the um, uh, uh, the literature and some of the cost savings around um, DMP, you, you know you see things from five percent to twenty percent to thirty percent, forty percent. Some of those are coming out through the product vendors. Some of those are through industry reports. But at the end of the day, you have to build your own model for what you think your cost savings will be. So if you look at this, uh, basically this company is spending $5 million in 2017 for media spend uh, or, or for marketing spend, um, broken down with some weighted percentages of e-commerce, social, paid search, mobile apps, email, digital display, and TV. Um, so this company has decided that they, they'll spend most of their money in other areas except for TV, which is a little bit lower than maybe, you know, if you were um, yeah, maybe a, a CPG company where you may want to spend more on TV. But at the end of the day, um, the DMP 
will help you decide um, how you should spend your money in terms of the right markets and the right media. Um, so if I'm using a DMP and I'm gathering all of my first party data and I'm uh, matching that to that third party data that's coming in from uh, from the cookie data on, cookie data on the internet uh, and really starting to build good segments um, and, and audiences and building right models and I should be able to target um, a consumer living in southern Florida um, who's 18 to 25 uh, or you know, maybe 21 to 25 um, you know, who, who serves from at 4 p.m. And, and, uh, and drinks Mountain Dew um, and then start saturating that market with either uh, banner ads, display ads, uh, radio or TV commercials uh, and email campaigns. Uh, but I won't be able to do that unless I'm using a DMP to build those audiences and target that right market. So again, this is just a um, just a sample. You know, if you took 20% across any of these areas, you know, you could end up at you know a one million dollar savings, um, and then really pump that uh, um, uh, put that number into an ROI model and say that you know after you know a certain period of time. And, you know, we had a cost savings of this much money, and these were the channels that we used to save money in. Again, this is a weighted, a weighted model, which you could change at any time uh, going forward. Okay. Um, third step of the business case is to uh, build a high-level ecosystem um, model. And this doesn't take a significant amount of time to do, but it is critical to do it uh, because Ultimately, someone's going to ask, well, what data is coming in and what are we doing with it and where is it going? Um, this is, again, a high-level model, and it's basically showing that I'm going to bring in some data from display and some CRM data. I'm going to bring in data from analytics. I'm going to bring in email data. Uh, if I'm collecting external um, market data, you know, if you're in a... Um, uh, if you're a distribution company and you have a, um, a, you know, a, a distribution network, you may, you may be getting depletion data, and that depletion data could be used um, within your model um, to build, um, to go into your DMP um, also. So all that is still considered first-party data, and then you uh, obviously um, marry that data to second- and third-party data, and it will help you build your audiences for your outbound campaign. So this is pretty key uh, to make sure you understand this ecosystem um, and how you're sort of able to um, uh, pitch this within your company. Um, the fourth part of the uh, business case is just building out a high-level timeline and a roadmap. So anything that's done uh, especially in the marketing transformation space or the digital space should be done in very small segments because one um, they tend to consume um, important resources um, they're limited resources in terms of you don't need a lot of people but they're important resources and so getting uh, a product in very quickly uh, is very important and so we recommend doing a proof of concept so something you can do in four months or less and in this particular example, we're going to start um, you know, working through a proof of concept, doing a DMP, working with vendors and a professional services firm to get a, a, a proof of concept up pretty quickly. And one, one thing that really helps to do is help uh, if you have people within the organization that are still concerned about the value, um, you know, doing a proof of concept is a great way to um, help prove out uh, more uh, pieces of the business case for you. Um, you know, in this particular model, we'll do a proof of concept for four months, and if that goes well, then we'll move into other phases. And those other phases could be connecting it to a marketing automation p uh, product, um, building more around around audience management, um, yeah, doing more around uh, analytics and journey analytics and personas, and helping you really refine your model. There could be a lot more integration that happens down the line. Um, and it really depends on if this is a divisional uh, product or is it a global product or a global implementation, uh, which will help define if it's really more of a, 
a two-phase timeline or you know a sort of a multi-year roadmap. Um, the fifth step of the business case is to really to build out your pricing model. So if we if we look at um, the key pieces of cost, typically if we if you're building out your business case and you and this is a capitalized expense, you want to um, at least gather you know basic um, costs. One is would be one would be your uh, in, uh, implementation costs, you know, external labor. So how much um, are your systems integrators um, charging you? How much training would be involved? Uh, there may also be companies that are looking at internal labor. Sometimes internal labor is also capitalized. And so those would be areas where you'd want to make sure you're, you can't, you're understanding those costs as you go into this. Um, software and other costs. So how much does it cost to, implement, uh, to get the software from the vendor? Uh, are those costs um, you know, capitalized over over one, five, uh, three, five years? Um, I mean, obviously, you need to work with your finance department to figure that piece. Uh, sometimes maintenance costs is not capitalized; it may be an expense. So those are things that are important as you as you plan this out. You know, how many resources do you need from IT? How many do you need from sales and marketing? Are they full time or part time? So those are those are pieces that would factor into um, into your um, into your business case model. Uh, and then you want to put together the final ask. And um, you know, this is a typical slide we build for a lot of clients. So uh, the final ask. Um, so we're recommending a proof of concept uh, for four months. Uh, in this particular uh, model, um, you know, recommending both both IT and sales and marketing, and then uh, it's always best to do a high and low because it gives you the ability to um, have a range, uh, so that um, uh, people can feel comfortable about the type of resources you'd need for a DMP implementation. Uh, if you're doing a proof of concept, um, you'll need to work with your vendor to figure out if um, uh, you can get a sort of a prorated cost, and that cost um, would factor into um, uh, the, the proof of concept. Now there are vendors who will say, you know what, I may not do a, PM, uh, uh, a, P, a proof of concept, but I, you know, I can uh, do a different type of arrangement as you pay for licenses, uh, but they may still require a one or two year license agreement, so that's a discussion point. Uh, professional uh, services and consultants um, are always important because, again, it's, it's not just uh, implementing the software, uh, buying the software, but the process behind it and how do you implement it and the integrations are also very important. Uh, you may want to also engage the vendor in their professional services if you think that uh, there's additional uh, skill sets or just to have skin in the game. Uh, but if your professional services consultants can actually uh, take care of that, then that you know, vendor professional services can go down to um, a much lower number. Uh, it is important to note that, you know, at least from a taxonomy perspective on the DMP platform, um, there's a lot of um, need from the actual service vendors. Um, so you're not going to be able to get away with not uh, probably engaging uh, the vendors, at least on a, a lot around the taxonomy discussion. Uh, then there's training, and then I ultimately, you know, this is just a sample, but a range. And you know, it's always better to ask for more on the high end of the range. Uh, and then scale back as needed. All right. Um, so, walking through those steps again, um, listing the benefits and challenges that executives can understand uh, from a DMP perspective. Discussion gets very complicated when you start talking about anonymized data and cookies and look-alike models. You know, it's just better to stay away from some of those terms if really just focus on what the business case is and how, to, how it's going to help you drive revenue into your company. Uh, understand and explain the current marketing spend, so um, using that framework and understanding what you spend and then taking that framework uh, and being able to show cost savings across each of the spend areas. Uh, three, uh, creating a high-level ecosystem map for IT leadership. IT is going to be at the table, so it's very important to make sure that um, that IT is uh, is engaged. 
um, deliver, develop a timeline that delivers a solution in four months, uh, and then build a pricing model with input from finance. Uh, Greg, any questions to this point? Yeah, Daryl, we actually have quite a few questions coming in. Um, are, are you ready to start taking those now? Um, uh, yes. Uh, okay. I, yeah, I think this is a, a great time. Perfect. Yeah. Then um, the first one in the queue is this. Can you talk about the challenges in matching cookie data from different sources and digital channels? Sure, yeah. The challenges are you want to pick a software vendor um, that has created um, the right key matching logic um, to do that. So that's not something you should be worried about. Um, the top vendors um, that are out there right now from a DMP perspective uh, all have various uh, types of um, uh, sort of uh, ID graphs that will help you um, do the matching. Some are stronger than others, um, but that, that should be part of the product itself. So the challenges are, um, are really related to making sure that the vendor has a strong product and um, it's built into their, um, their roadmap, uh, but also um, you know, data, data, data in is very important. So if your ecosystem does have um, you know, very bad data, uh, it, it may be challenging. So, I always recommend you start smaller, uh, get a, a subset of data within the ecosystem that you trust as first party data before you start trying to match that up with third party cookie data because um, uh, it's very important to get that right and then you can always build on uh, and add other integration points later. Okay, good. Uh, Daryl, the second question is this. What are some qualifying questions for smaller to mid-sized companies that would help us to understand if we can prove out ROI? Should we be looking at things like advertising spend, web visits? What should we be looking at? What kind of qualifying questions should we be asking? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, I, we get that question a lot that our DMP is only built for you know, the global 50 or the global 100 clients, and it, it is not. It's much bigger um, than that. Uh, it is a much bigger ecosystem than that. Um, a lot of uh, service vendors in the DMP space um, are now um, putting out products that allow you to sort of implement a DMP light, so a lighter version of a DMP, so you don't have to uh, go all in on it on a pretty high capital investment spend. So look for vendors that have a DMP light solution. Um, it may not give you all of the functionality or all of the um, vendors that are providing cookie data to the DMPs, but it does get you started in the right direction. Um, so that's, that's pretty key. Um, also, um, I would ask questions around, um, you know, how can I push off costs initially before you know, really going into a big spend. Uh, and then there's also a discussion around um, should, should your agency control the DMP? Uh, should you control the DMP? Um, you know, a lot of times there are agencies that um, will, will run a DMP and then provide services to smaller companies. Uh, the challenge is that um, you're on uh, you don't. You may not be their priority customer, and may not be able to have the um, sort of the platinum level service versus if you had your own DMP, where you can control your own modeling um, and audience building. So um, smaller companies should definitely be in the game because um, um, it's very important um, uh, uh, to have a DMP in this in the digital age. Okay. Yeah, Daryl. That answer kind of leads us right into the very next question. Um, next question is. Some agencies offer DMP solutions as part of programmatic media buys. So how do you determine whether the agency DMP model is the optimal approach versus buying something like a SaaS solution such as Adobe? Uh, great question. Um, and, um, and I've stayed away from vendor names on this call because we're vendor agnostic. Um, 
uh, you know, as we do, we we go to market across three basic areas, and I'll answer that question in a minute, uh, Greg. Uh, one is blueprinting, so helping to build these business cases and and to provide uh, clients with gui clients with guidance in this area. And then uh, after that, um, uh, implementation. And then um, after implementation, um, uh, uh, sort of post production support. Uh, agencies provide the third level, which is that sort of managed services or post-production. As part of media buying, you're, you're buying DMP services. But if you think about it, um, and, they, and they provide really, really good services, but again, you're one of maybe 500 clients. And so, um, you know, you may, not, you may not always get the best quality service, number one. Two, uh, you may not always be first in line. Um, you may be getting the re you may be the recipient of just someone else's uh, media um, uh, research. Um, if you have the DMP within your own organization, um, you, you control the data. You control, uh, you know, all of your first-party data, which you'd have to send to the media agency anyway. Um, you control um, all the security around it yourself. Um, you can build your own segments and audiences and then vet those within your company. Uh, and um, it really allows you to have a lot more flexibility on the integrations where um, agencies are not involved with your integration. So if you want to bring in data from two different CRM systems, um, you know, uh, Adobe, uh, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and that might have been an Adobe uh, experience manager uh, versus an audience manager. But uh, if you want to bring in data from um, you know, e-commerce sites, uh, if you want to bring in data from your analytics areas, if you want to bring in data uh, from data warehouses within your ecosystem or depletion data from your distributors, uh, it would be recommended to have the DMP in-house. Again, start small so it doesn't blow your budget. Okay, okay. Uh, Daryl, one one other question just came in, and I know you kind of touched on it on this last slide, but somebody's asking if you can explain what lookalike modeling is and how it works. Oh, great question. Sure. Um, I think we're going to have another uh, in-depth uh, webinar just on some of these topics. These are great topics, Greg, um, to, to have further uh, deep dives down on. So. Um, if I um, so imagine I'm in your company, um, maybe you're a uh, you're a pharmaceutical a company, and um, you know your typical a customer or, or consumer, um, you know, maybe you have a retail division. You, you know, looks like this person. You know, he's uh, 40 to 50. Uh, he's married. Um, you know, uh, you know. I know with, with pharmaceutical and life science, you have to be careful in terms of um, uh, you know what you can model. But uh, just assume that you know these type of people are within your ecosystem. They have this kind of salary. Um, you know, maybe, maybe they live in this part of the country. Um, so you so these sort of personas that you build within your company are really critical because then you want to take all of this fantastic data that the DMPs provide of all of the data collection uh, uh, sources on the internet. So a DMP may be getting data from, um, you know, um, you know auto.com or from um, you know, Schwab.com or, you know, um, you know, different types of uh, companies that provide this sort of cookie data. And then what you want to do is take this data and match it up to your first party data within your company and figure out how these sort of anonymized data uh, out in the DMP uh, world um, and build models that sort of look alike the same people that are already within your, your ecosystem. So if you've got, um, you know, five, you know, or ten personas or types of customers or consumers that you would typically target, um, you want to use all of that um, and match that up to the vast amount of, of data that's been collected on the internet and build lookalike models. And then those models will help you target the right audiences um, as you buy media um, uh, within either a certain demographic or geography. 
Okay. All right, great, Daryl. There's one more question. Um, no problem. And, and I guess earlier <laughs> in the deck you mentioned uh, the term of taxonomy. And the question is, can you explain what you mean by taxonomy? Do you mean customer and or persona attributes? Yeah, yeah. You can look at it that way. But, you know, again, the reason I brought up, yeah. So the taxonomy is sort of the underlining layer um, that... Um, that controls how your segments um, sort of interact uh, within the DMP platform. So the reason I brought that up earlier is because you know a lot of the service um, product vendors uh, prefer to uh, make customizations and, and sort of detail changes to their own taxonomy. And this is important because it's a SaaS product and you obviously want to make sure that you're doing it, uh, doing it right, and it's very complicated. Um, so you want the service vendor to have skin in the game, the product vendor to have uh, skin in the game as it relates to taxonomy. Um, but um, yeah, so to, um, to the point, yeah, it allows you to. Um, it is the underlying sort of layer, or I don't want to say metadata, but the underlying layer um, that eventually will allow you to build uh, the models that um, will eventually build your audiences. Okay, I, I think uh, that's that's it for the questions for now, Daryl. I think you've got one more slide. I do. Um, so, um, as part of you know our DMP series, which there'll be a few more that are coming up, we thought this is a great opportunity to sort of uh, take a step back and and really help clients focus on getting to the next um, next uh, evolution in their journey. Uh, so, uh, as part of our um, our blueprinting methodology. Um, we have deliverables or, or parts of our methodology that really help to do uh, map, map out your high-level uh, capability map and your marketing maturity model. And these are the foundational areas that will allow you to start understanding which parts of your organization um, really need to be part of a DMP um, uh, uh, project. Uh, I'll go to the next slide and come back, but this is basically uh, sort of part of the framework where we look at capabilities across the marketing ecosystem, uh, and then we sort of really dig down into which areas of marketing, IT, uh, adjacencies like product, customer care, customer service, uh, e-commerce would need to be uh, involved in a DMP project. And then after you color code those areas and you have discussions, you kind of come up with initiatives that would drive you in the right direction that you would need a DMP platform. Uh, areas that, uh, that are not colored or areas that are sort of wish lists or we can do in the future, areas that are darker will lead you down the path of, yep, we do need a DMP and these are the reasons why. So um, that piece, um, we're gonna, we are offering it a three-day on-site to do the assessment. Uh, we can contact uh, Greg Root, um, uh, who is our moderator. Um, if you have interest, there's a free assessment um, where we will send um, a team out to sit with you. It can, if it can be done less than three days, that's also um, uh, valuable also. But it, it, um, it, it, um, the key here is it's actually um, uh, critical because it ends up being also one of those foundational parts of the uh, business case and helping you sell it within your organization. Okay, Daryl, uh, we have no more questions in the queue, and uh, so I just want to thank you today for all of your expertise and insights, and I want to thank the audience for their active participation and all their good questions, and uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be inviting you to the next DMP webinar very, very shortly. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.